Alrighty, thank you very much everybody for joining us today. We definitely appreciate your time. Today we're going to be talking about the top three technologies that will impact the AECO industry in uh, 2018. So before we get rolling on that, just a little bit of a uh, setup. <coughs> so who we are. So for those who aren't familiar, Microdesk is an AECO industry consulting firm. We've been around since 94. We currently have 12 locations around the US as well as the UK. And our team is over 140 people just on our technical consulting team that we have our own in-house software development team as well as all the other people on our sales and support and marketing and everybody else. What that means is that all of our consulting specialists have a background in the industry, which allows us to support our clients with things like actual building information modeling. So we can actually create that content for them. We can teach them how to do it. We can work with them for a long-term strategy and assessments. We can make sure that they have a full understanding of where they currently stand and how to reach their goals. We can mentor and help out. And again, we have our own team on staff that does application development. So if there's a shortcoming in software or a need that needs to be connected for workflow, we can help out with that. <clears throat> now, for today's presentation, the presenters are going to be myself, Peter Marchese. Uh, I am the senior technology evangelist. My background is I've been in the industry for over 20 years now, working at Microdesk for uh, 12 and a half and working in architecture for 10. So my goal is to focus more so on the R&D and emerging technologies. This includes things like cloud technologies and a lot of the tools that we're gonna be talking about in uh, today's session. Now, a couple of little things here. Everybody is gonna be muted for the duration, but if you do have a question, please feel free to type it into the chat or the questions window. I'll be keeping an eye on that and I'll either answer it as it fits into the flow or I'll take care, I'll take care of all the questions at the very end. Again, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to pop them in there. <coughs> now, for today's agenda, what we're gonna be looking at are what we feel the top three technologies are that are gonna be impacting 2018. Those three are connected BIM, the Internet of Things, and virtual reality. Now, before we hop into this, I do want to just ask everybody just a couple of quick questions, just to give a better understanding of what your background is, if you actually have had a chance to work with any of these tools. So, just going to ask three quick questions. So, first one is going to be, what is your role? Hey, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, participating in that. So next one is, are you currently using any of the BIM applications? So this would be Revit, uh, BIM 360, Navisworks, working within a BIM workflow, essentially. Okay. And then the last one here. Are you currently using anything for virtual reality or augmented reality? Great to see a bunch of people actually are using this, and hopefully we can convert a few more of the uh, full-on nodes to the plan too soon. <coughs> Great, so thank you very much again for participating in those. I appreciate it. The first one we're going to start talking about is actually virtual reality. Now, for people who are not familiar with this or haven't worked on this, <coughs> typically virtual reality is going to fall into one of two different use cases. Either mobile on the bottom, which is based off of a phone, or the desktop, which would be tethered to a computer on the top there. The computer one tends to offer much more capability. And it's used for a lot of different things. It can be used in design. So the option on the left there is showing how you can actually navigate, say, a design space and actually pick different colors from a swatch and then change that material live. So that one there is actually done with Autodesk uh, Stingray or Max Interactive workflow. The example on the far right there is actually using it for coordination, going through, getting dimensions, flagging different objects, marking it up. So we're seeing many more use cases of people taking advantage of VR. Now, one of the great 
uh, blurbs that I got from uh, <coughs> from a company was McCarthy Building Companies. And this is an example that we've actually worked with with some of our clients, where if you're doing projects where you need to have the client actually interact with a space or understand it, a lot of the times the construction firm will actually build mock-ups. This is very much the case for a lot of healthcare or hospital design projects. What they actually did was they built this in virtual reality. So number one, they didn't actually need the construction time or fees to build the space, even if it was done out of cardboard. But they're making it virtual, so they can go in and actually navigate and interact with objects virtually. And because nothing actually has to get physically built, if there's a change or, hey, what if we do this? A lot of the times you can just go into the software, make that change, and then push it right back out into VR. So we're seeing a lot of people look to embrace this with actual uh, design work or working, interacting with the client. Another example is for training. So a lot of companies have turned to using virtual reality to augment their ability to train their employees. Uh, this example is showing a welding setup. And the thing I love about this example is that they have the numbers to back up this use case. They've been doing it long enough that they're able to actually show that the group that actually did training using virtual reality in addition to standard, as opposed to just going through traditional, was much faster uh, suited to getting uh, they got jobs much faster, they progressed much faster, and their skills were actually better than the traditional all the way through. Now what does that mean for construction projects or construction companies? If you need to train employees on how to use certain equipment, this is an option. For designers, if your client, the building owner, needs to train personnel for security, for maintenance, for management, they can actually start training using your model so it opens up additional services that you can then offer. Now, all of this that I just showed, that's all already there. So the key here is, you know, what's happening in 2018? Why do we feel that virtual reality is going to be one of the big impacts? <coughs> now, the reason for this is partially because of new hardware options. Presently, if you look at mobile, we have a couple of options. You've got cardboard. You've got the uh, Google Daydream, which comes directly from Google. You've got Samsung Gear VR, and you've got a smattering of sort of third-party ones that are basically Google uh, Cardboard. On the desktop, what we have is the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift. What you're looking at here now are the different companies' versions that fit into the Microsoft mixed reality headsets. Now, at least at the moment, they're not really full mixed reality. They're really just uh, virtual reality headsets. But this offers more opportunity, more options, and in some cases at a lower price point. The other real great benefit here is that these are much simpler to set up. All you're looking at is a headset and two controllers. Boom, done, that's it. Typically when you're looking at something like the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive, what that needs is a camera or a light cube or something else to help track where you are as you move through a space. These little sort of dots on all these headsets, those are actually the cameras that can see the controllers. So in that case, that's actually helping out. So the camera in the headset sees the controller, and the six-axis gyroscopes and accelerometers inside of the headsets track where you're going. <coughs> now, these ones here still need to be tethered to a computer, but what we've seen gives us reason to believe that in 2018, we will have full-on wireless options coming down the line from both of the uh, first-party versions, for the first version. So the one on the left is an adapter that can be connected to a HTC Vive. The one on the right is what people have been referring to as the Santa Cruz sort of alpha version from Oculus Rift. Again, it's a wireless headset, so you don't need to tether it to a computer. You're actually having much more freedom of movement. <coughs> so we have hardware options. There's more to pick from. It should be easier to work with and easier to set up, which is going to make it a lot easier for clients and companies to adopt it. They don't need to have a, a VR specialist just to turn it on, which in some cases doesn't is what it feels like. Now, outside of that, there's also the multi-user aspect of it. Right now, virtual reality is really cool for people to get into, and it can be a lot of fun for people to watch somebody else in it. But it can also be kind of lonely. You're walking around in space, and unless the designers have actually put in uh, 
AI or other figures, there's nothing else in there. You're talking to people who are maybe looking on a screen and can see what you see, but they're not really experiencing it. So just like what we're seeing with a lot of our design tools, we're now get looking at options to bring multiple people into the same space and navigate it in virtual reality. So the one on the left here is from Iris VR. The example on the right is from Insight VR. <coughs> Both of these are expected to release next year. I know Iris has a beta out for this that you can sign up for. The, the benefit of this is that if you want to walk through a virtual space with a client, with a consultant, with other users from different locations, different states, even different countries, this allows you to navigate that space and point to their lo certain locations. If you look up there, that's what I was talking about where the light is in the wrong spot, or this is that conflict that I was mentioning. Not only are you just looking at the same screen, but now you're actually in the space. You have that sense of scale and the ambiance that VR conveys, and now you have that sense of coordination and communication from the multi-user aspect. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention augmented reality. <coughs> so augmented reality, again, not new. But what we're seeing now is many more hardware options. Apple is pushing very heavily with their AR toolkits, their the AR kit. That's a part of their new devices in the OS. So on the left, you can see they're looking at a physical model of sort of the uh, mothership layout. And it can actually expand and sort of pull apart and go into that. On the right, what you're looking at is essentially there's a location that's been placed. And it's almost a portal. You walk through that. And it knows where you are because of GPS and accelerometer data. But it takes you into that space. So you can essentially transport yourself using this into a design option. So if you walk over here, I'll show you what we're looking to do with the room. You know, things like that. It's not virtual reality. You're not wearing this on your head. You're looking at it through a screen. But now this is going to be much more prevalent. Many more people have devices that are capable of this. So we're going to start seeing more things on that front. Outside of that, the specialist devices that really apply to what we do. So at the top, you've got Daiquiri. They now have a non-helmet version. So if you're looking to use something that would allow you to do building maintenance, I want to walk down the hallway, and I can look at an air handler, or I can look at a vent and say, OK, well, what are the settings on that vent? What are the readings that I'm getting from my sensors? I want to look at that wall and see through the wall and see the pipes that were laid out for my design model, so I know exactly where to cut or drill. The one on the bottom there is actually Google Glass. <coughs> for those who aren't aware, Google Glass came out a while ago, and it was more for developers and enthusiasts. And it didn't catch on the way a lot of people expected it would. So they went back, worked on it some more, and what they're doing now is they're focusing on pushing it out for enterprise. So similar thing that Daiquiri is doing. So in construction, in manufacturing, in design, you're focusing on not just somebody who wants to walk around the street with this, but how can this make my job better, faster, more efficient, and safer? So they're focusing on that. And again, these are things that will make our workflow much more consistent and smooth. <coughs> OK, so we had the virtual reality, which also kind of includes augmented reality in my mind. Uh, next thing that we're talking about is the Internet of Things. Now, a lot of the times when I am describing the Internet of Things, I tend to include this little statement, if this, then that. The Internet of Things is not just connecting a whole bunch of stuff and having a lot of data flying all over the place. You need to do something with that data, or it's kind of useless. It's, you know, why are we spending all this time and money to make connections? So, you know, if the temperature goes too high, then we need to have a fail safe. If this moves too fast, I need to hit the brakes. You're creating these rules, or in some cases recipes, to take advantage of that data, to use it, to, to form it to a look to format it so that it actually is beneficial. This little video from Autodesk is a great example of that. So essentially somebody could be working in an office, the temperature maybe is getting a little bit too high. And a sensor reading shows that there's an issue. <coughs> so what this can actually do is automatically call a service technician. So sensors move beyond sort of safe levels or, or the specific levels that have been set. At that point, we know there's an issue. Or at least we need to 
investigate this. That sends data, creates a ticket. That app automatically sends an email to the service technician who can then pull up all of this data. So what he's actually using here is Autodesk's uh, BIM Ops service. So they go in there, they do the work, they log into Ops, and that pulls in all of the information. And this can be easily pulled up by just scanning a QR code. So they know name, model, the history of the object. Then they can make those changes and that sets it. And then the occupant can actually say, okay, everything's good, and close out the ticket. But this is looking at taking all that data and the connectedness of it. Now, most of the time when we talk about Internet of Things, we're focusing on like building units and air handling. So what I wanted to talk about is how some of this is going to change from the construction side of things. Now, not just an evolution of the parts for the other side, but for something a little bit different. Now, from a safety standpoint or from a health standpoint, most of us probably have some kind of fitness tracker. You know, it's able to count our steps. It can tell if we're going up. We can tell if we're going down. And if it's connected to a phone, it can probably track exactly where we've walked to or from or ridden a bike. When we look at things on the construction side, we're starting to see more of that same kind of technology get built into our safety devices. So on the right-hand side, what we're looking at is a hard hat that has sensors and a small computing device in the top. The thing on the left there is actually a gas sensor. So in a lot of cases, if you're working in areas where there might be gas, some people might have this. And that can tell you if you're in areas that have gas leaks or if there's any problems. But the sensors that can do this are getting much cheaper, much smaller, and more easily integrated to other devices. So that's the kind of thing that can actually be integrated into regular hard hats. There's actually a company called Human Condition that focuses on safety <coughs> and adding more information into their safety devices. So whether it's something that allows you to automatically charge this the solar from the brim, it can track where you are on the site, and if somebody's RFID card that's in the, uh, their gear goes into an area that is off limits, it can actually set off lights on their vest. If it senses from accelerometer movement, falling, an airbag can also go off. Falls are one of the biggest issues when it comes to safety for construction. So all of this technology that is available in a lot of other fields, it's finally starting to move its way into the actual construction side. And again, the Internet of Things is connecting data. So if I have a sensor that I am wearing that can get me information, that also then can make rules. It can notify me that there's problems. It can then send that data back to the construction trailer and not actually notify somebody else to actually go there and maybe fix things make a meeting, call attention to a problem and get more people out of it or get other people there to actually deal with it. And the main thing here is not that there's data and things are connected. It's that we can do something with that. So, additionally on safety, the devices that people can place inside of the building is getting much more robust and much simpler to work with. So what they're actually putting there is a strain sensor on the rebar. Now, a lot of that, it can actually be, <coughs> excuse me, set up as an RFID. doesn't need power. Essentially, if you, anybody here has an easy pass in their car, you're not putting batteries in that. You're not plugging it into the cigarette lighter. When you go through the toll booth, it's actually read by the power from the sensors or from, from the reader. Same idea is this. Somebody can walk by, scan that from outside the concrete, and that can actually pull that data in there. Other ones, like on roadways, they pull their energy from the actual vibration and movement of the road. And in a similar condition, RFID tags can be applied to the equipment on site, making sure things don't get lost, making sure things that can or could possibly become a hazard are easily tracked along the site, making sure they don't get placed in a location that could become a problem, whether it's just because of weight or it's because it's a tripping or fall hazard. Talking about inanimate objects and then the benefit that getting data from them, now let's talk about animated objects. <coughs> Over the last year or two, we've heard a lot about autonomous cars, you know, how they can actually work on a roadway. They're testing them in a lot of different cities. And what's actually happening now is they're doing the same thing for construction equipment. So a company called Built Robotics was actually started by an ex-Googler. 
And one of the things that they're working on is automating construction equipment, earth movers. So you see that big, almost looks like a uh, travel case on the roof? That has sensors and controllers. Another company in Japan, Komatsu, teamed with a company from San Francisco, Skycatch, to connect the readings from the UAVs. Essentially, the UAVs would take the photogrammic information, create 3D models of the topography, and then users can use that to manage and maintain and remotely pilot earthwork uh, vehicles. And a lot of this is done, being done because there actually aren't enough skilled laborers to work the machines. It's not so much that the machines who are trying to get rid of workers, there just aren't enough to actually fill the jobs. So they're looking at ways that automating and making things more efficient, and in many cases, safer and more accurate. Again, we're looking at the Internet of Things here to connect these devices. UAVs, they're not necessarily new, and I definitely expect to see more of them this year, but them being a UAV, it's a tool. It really comes down to how do you use that tool and connecting the data and the information that these different tools can work from is really where I think the power next year is going to come. And that falls more in the IoT. Now, another thing here is machine learning. And again, I'm not treating that as a whole other topic. I'm treating that as part of the IoT. For machine learning here, what I'm looking at is a service called SmartVid. What this actually does is it leverages the machine learning to look at photos that have been uploaded from construction sites. And it can automatically tag a lot of images. It can tell if this is a person or if this is not a person. It can check for vests. It can check for different things <coughs> that can create issues. And it can actually tie into other services like BIM 360 Field. The main thing here is that when we get data, we want to utilize it. We want to connect it to other things. So when I start talking about this can tag photos and say this is where people are, this is where other things that I am more interested in are, well, if it just lives in this one service, it's not going to be that great for me. I want to tie this into other services. I want it to say that when I find an issue that this person is not using a harness or this person is in an unsafe location, I need that to create an issue. So connecting the service, I'm connecting the data, and I'm trying to enable better and faster coordination. And then with all, all this data that I have, I need to manage that. And we're seeing more services come online that allow us to read this information, to work with this information, and manage my process. <clears throat> so that way I can, again, do more, hopefully faster and more efficiently. Cool. So that brings us to number three, connected business. If you attended the webinar that we had not too long ago, one of the things that we talked about was how Connected BIM got here. So we started off with the era of documentation, but we moved off of the boards and into the computer. But CAD was really, you know, we were just documenting. We were just taking what we did before by hand and redoing it on the computer. So then there was the era of optimization. BIM started really happening and catching on. And hopefully as you were able to implement it, you find your workflow started to become a little bit more optimized. I, weren't cre I wasn't creating red lines for the same object on five sheets. I would create a red line that affected an element or an object, and that would update multiple things. I was becoming a little bit more efficient with my workflows, which brought us to the area of, era of connection. We're working on connected BIM workflows. Regardless of where we are in the life cycle, we're connecting different people, different services, different things to be more efficient. And some of the examples, <coughs> so we have a project here in Australia that actually had seven global locations. So we had 45 people working around the clock. And what they did was they looked at putting the models online. So in this case, it was BIM 360 team in collaboration for Revit. So by putting the whole thing online, that reduced the uh, infrastructure. Then they didn't have to manage any servers. That was done being, that, that was being done by Autodesk. And that allowed the ecosystem of the project team to work via the cloud. They can do markups, they can review, they can see, they can get data. You know, if you have somebody who doesn't know how to use Revit, who cares? They can open up a browser. They can still take advantage of that coordination that everybody else is working through. When we look at it from an infrastructure standpoint, <coughs> this is a project in Norway. 
120 different people that you needed to talk to and review and connect for the approvals. So what they were doing was every 14 days they had a project review. In order to really make sure that things worked, they were putting things online. They made sure that everybody can see what was going on. They were able to take advantage of the InfraWorks tools to make sure everything was legible and easily understood. And they found by doing this, by connecting all the people, by having a workflow that was intelligent, they were able to result uh, to save 20% in time savings. And that was just for the approval phase of the project. And on the construction side of things, we're looking at a stadium in Minneapolis, US. This project on the construction side, when we look at all the different uh, locations, all the different connection points, all the different things that you have to sort of say, this is where it is in the model. Is it in the right location in the real world? And if it's not, how do we affect this? How do we fix that? So they were tracking 60,000 elements because of that. From that, they managed 20,000 items with BIM 360 field. So they were able to identify things in there on the punch list. They were able to manage it, make sure everything was in the right location. And that put them six weeks ahead of schedule for the completion of the project. Again, the idea of connected BIM, pulling all of these different things together, making sure that they can talk to each other, <coughs> making sure that we're not just working in a vacuum or in a silo. That's the big thing that we're starting to see happen more and more and more. We really feel that this is going to keep driving forward in 2018 because the acceleration of tools, that's not slowing down. More and more countries are adopting specific requirements for BIM, you know, whether it's only for government projects, like currently in the UK, or if it's certain municipalities, like in the US, those kind of requirements are pushing the industry all over. And as part of that, we're getting more and more people working on projects that are not in the same location. Whether it's a single firm that has four people in the New York office and three people in the California office working together, or if it's teams that are worldwide, multiple people working on an IPD project, where now they're all are all they all are working literally together as almost a single entity. We're taking advantage of those kind of things that are driving <coughs> our workflow and our process and in many cases our industry forward. So what we're looking at again is again 2018 as we move forward, connected BIM, VR and Internet of Things that we feel are going to be some of the major things that are moving forward. And something that all three of those have in common is connectivity and collaboration. All of those are enhancing the ability for people to connect, understand, and work together and make sure that our processes are more accurate and more efficient. Cool. So I'd love to take any questions anybody has. There, there's one here right now. Will there be a hard copy of this webinar sent out afterwards? The, this webinar is actually being recorded and it should be placed on our YouTube page within a few days. And while I review the questions or anything in the chat window, I'd like to ask one more survey here. So was this information helpful? So hopefully it was. If it wasn't, always feel free to reach out to us. Let us know what you're interested in, what things you would love to have us cover. <coughs> Got a question here regarding virtual reality. Do we see the hardware requirements coming down soon? With the versions that are going to be coming out for the Microsoft one, we are seeing the hardware requirements go down a little bit for that. In some cases, I think it's going to be a mix. Every year, the computers get faster and more capable. So the base requirements are going to be met sooner and sooner by newer computers that just get better and better every single year. Outside of that, same thing for phones. The newer phones are almost you know, jumps ahead of the previous ones. So they're going to be a little bit faster and a little bit smoother every year. But uh, I think as the hardware gets more efficient and smoother, I think that will help. The biggest thing is that you're trying to have essentially an HD image that is refreshing very, very fast in front, uh, very close to your eye. So it's not like it's trying to just run the computer screen. And that does uh, require a good amount of hardware. Another question, are there online classes available to learn BIM? Uh, yes, but it really is going to depend on what you're looking for when you say BIM. 
Uh, Vim isn't any one specific program. It really is a workflow. So it could be Revit, it could be Navisworks, it could be I'm not looking at any one program. I need to know and understand the entire workflow. But if that's the case, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be glad to help out and give you whatever information that you need. Uh, I know we have a couple of upcoming webinars. One is going to be on daylighting. That will be coming up on the 12th. The next two in January are going to be specific about uh, hacks for engineers and architects for the AEC collection, little things that you can do and take a little bit further with what you've already owned. So some of them will be tips and tricks, and other things will be you know, little ways that you can get more mileage out of what you've got. Uh, another question here. Why is the screen that you see in VR devices, such as the Samsung Gear, poor quality? So the Samsung Gear, that's really going to depend on the phone that you put in there. So the, the Gear itself just has two little lenses that are in front of your eyes. And for some people, you might need to adjust those so that they're a little bit wider. Uh, I do know that it's nowhere near as bad as it is from 94, but that does depend on the phone that you put in there. If you have an older phone or a phone with less graphics, those lenses are kind of like a magnifying glass. So if the phone itself has poor resolution, you're going to see that even more so. If you have a newer one that has a lot of the, you might see PPI, stands for pixels per inch. So if it's very dense, it should look very nice. But the, the desktop-based ones are always more powerful than the mobile ones. And they are going to have a higher resolution and look clearer. Uh, next question. What would you what would I estimate to be the industry uh, adoption percentage for IoT and virtual reality augmented reality? <coughs> so for VR and AR, I'll do that one first. I would say probably anywhere from fifteen to thirty percent of the industry has at the very least tried it. I would say maybe 20, 25% has adopted it and is looking into it. The thing that is interesting is a lot of people don't realize they already own tools that can allow them to use virtual reality. So the biggest investment tends to be on the hardware side of things. So a lot of firms use Revisto or Enscape or Lumion. All of those actually have a VR mode. You plug in your headset, you can go to that. Uh, outside of that, if you own the AEC collection, you have Revit Live. That has a direct connection. And again, if you own the AEC collection, you've got Live for free. It's already there. If you <coughs> are looking at, I want to go in from A to B, hit a button, and I'm done. Again, there's a bunch of tools for that. I showed uh, Iris and Insight VR. Those are great for that, too. So more and more people, I think, are realizing that it's not as complex as it was and that if they tried it four years ago, it's much better than it was then. So it has made leaps and bounds to become much more efficient and much smoother of a workflow. IoT, on the other hand, is a bit different. I would say a lot of people that are more in mechanical or are in uh, facility maintenance or management, they're using it to a certain degree. You know, a lot of the building systems, the BMS systems, already have that kind of data in there. It's really the design side and pushing it into the ownership side, that still needs to grow a lot. But the, the tools are getting smaller, they're getting cheaper, they're getting easier to use. With many states looking at budget cuts, like they're like for bridge inspections, there just aren't enough inspectors to actually check every single bridge in most states. So by adding things like these sensors during or even after construction, they're able to get information to prioritize the inspection dates to make sure that you're not going to go to some place and then find out later on that, you know, yeah, three three days after you left, there was a crack that showed up, and that has happened. So that one I would say is behind VR, but I think it's going to catch up relatively quick in the next year or two years. <coughs> okay, uh, another question here: How do you manage the picture? Uh, the, with the GPS information. So that was with that, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, the construction VR tool. So you would set up what you're looking for that service to look for in the, the photos. And then it can actually run through and using the machine learning to pick that out. The cloud services today are getting very powerful and actually very accurate when it comes to looking at a photo and understanding what's in it. Uh, if you look at any of the the papers that get published from Microsoft or Google or some of the universities, 
they're able to look at a photo and not just say what color it is. They can say that this photo has food in it. This has a bicyclist. This has a car. So they're getting better at understanding what's actually in the photo. You know, or if anybody here uses social media, same thing, face tagging. It's able to look at a photo of you and your friends and tell you who they are. Kind of the same idea. So that service, it's not really looking for the individuals that are in there, but it's saying, okay, I see that there's a person here. There's another person here. There's a vehicle in the shot. So it's using that kind of technology to help you understand what's in the photo. And when you're looking through the construction photos for certain things, it makes it easier to find it. It's not looking for the name of the photo, but it's looking for the tags that have been placed automatically. If anybody has any questions coming up after this, definitely please feel free to reach out. We'd love to help you out. The e email there is at team at microdesk.com. And thank you very much, everybody, for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Peter Marchese, and I'm glad to help you out with anything that comes up. So thank you very much. Have a great day.